All right. Um, so we have have joined us uh, Kawita G. Adams. Hello, Kawita. Hi, how are you? Good afternoon. Good, good, good to have you. And uh, you're superintendent from City School District of Albany, New York. So you're up there. Is the, are the leaves changing yet? They are starting to change. Absolutely. Oh, yeah, it's so beautiful up there. I haven't been there for a really long time, but I used to come annually to Albany and go to a big conference that my company put on with the egg. Oh, wow. You know, the mm -hmm. conference across from the, yeah, with the egg. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. The great venue, great venue. Yeah. It's, it, it feels like you're underground most of the time though. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. But fun. So we're going to get started with you. Okay. Um, and have you just sort of give us some background. I have a, a barrage of questions I want to ask all three of you. Hopefully they'll both join. We lost a different superintendent earlier today because okay. our experience now nationwide is people in your position are getting, you know, sidetracked daily. <laughs> and that part of your role is basically be surprised at nothing. Absolutely. What's going to happen for your day. Yeah. Um, so I, I want to ask, you know, basically have you give us a little background. Okay, well, um, our school district is roughly, I'll start with just the demographics to give you a picture of who we are, and then talk a little bit about uh, some of the lessons that we've learned through our digital transition. But our district is, um, it's the capital of New York. Uh, we are roughly, the entire city is a little bit less than 100,000 people. Uh, we have about 9,000 students. Our Black African American population is about 46%. Hispanic population, about 18%. Asian Pacific Islanders, 17%. Multiracial, 6%. Our white population is about 20%. Roughly 16% of our students are students with disabilities. And our ELL population is about 10%. And we have about 65% of our population uh, would be economically disadvantaged or classified as economically disadvantaged. Wow. So we um, we are very diverse. Uh, we have a we are a welcoming city in and of itself, but our district is a welcoming district. So about 1,300 of our students are immigrant students. Uh, we know that that number is predicted to increase now. Um, as we move forward with some of, some of our, um, our families from Afghanistan that may be coming here. And so we're looking to see that number increase. We have some special programs. We have an Albany International Center, which is a two-year opt-in program for our immigrant students uh, at the secondary level. And so uh, typically they will spend two years in an immersion program, and then they'll go um, they'll transition back to their home school. And that is an opt-in pro that is an opt-in school. So we've um, learned quite a bit over the past 18 months. And um, when we talk about where our focus is and what we're looking at, we did a survey with our community with regard to the federal funds that we were receiving. And in every demographic, the number one item with social emotional learning and well-being, the mental health well-being of our students, our families, our faculty, and our staff. And so that's an area that we have as a focus. And we were seeing that as educators within our system because we noticed that our students felt a little disconnected. Those students who were learning virtually, that sense of belonging and community that you get when you are in person, those were some of the things that we were starting to see um, some disconnects. And so we knew that we would need to embrace social emotional learning. We knew that we would need to build in that connectedness with our students mm -hmm. and with our families um, so that we could make sure that we were delivering the best instruction possible. Within that delivery of instruction, we looked at technology integration and developing a true blended learning platform. When we initially transitioned to a blended learning platform, it was basically taking what you did in person and now applying it to the Google Classroom. Mm -hmm. Well, we've gotten a little bit better with that because we have um, done the research and our our assistant superintendent, Karen Bechtel, over curriculum instruction and professional development, 
partnered with our assistant superintendent over assessment accountability and technology integration, Mr. Kent Baker, they partnered so that we could look at what is it now that we have this baseline of, of Google Classroom, how do we transition to a true blended learning model? And so we put together the professional development, we did a lot of the research, and so we now have a plan moving forward and that's how we started this year. So that's part of that dig digital transition. We mm -hmm. started this year with a big launch and kickoff about what is true blended learning and do we have the resources available? Yes, we do have the resources available. We are one-to-one -one with our Chromebooks. We have partnered with different vendors with regard to internet access for our families. So we're able to provide that internet access for our families uh, within, our, within our school district um, through various partnerships that we have. So uh, one of the things that I would reach out and say, um, we have a homeless population. We know that we have our McKinney, our McKinney Vento students. And in our shelters, we were able to provide a bank of computers and also hotspots for internet access so that our students, if they were in the shelters, they could still access their homework and classwork and tune into their classes, et cetera, at all the different levels. Uh, family engagement, we saw an increase in family engagement because we were doing a lot of programs virtually. And so by being able to provide the technology in the home, uh, we were able to see an increase in our family engagement and the empowerment and just the participation of our families being able to participate, I'm sorry, participate virtually. Um, as we have moved forward this year and we are 100% in person, we are still balancing that for our families. So some of our events, if they're smaller events, they may be held in person because then we can definitely assure you know, social distancing and all of the COVID protocols, but then there's a digital component. There's the virtual component to that particular small event. Our larger events, we are maintaining the virtual environment for our larger events. And then of course, um, being able to safely bring back and enhance our before and after school programming for our students so that they can get that connectedness. This is a lot. How, how many? <laughs> yeah. And you're like, and I somehow didn't go, you know, insane. Um, that's amazing on you. Um, so let's talk about um, kind of what you went through a little bit. You know, this was emotional probably for you and your staff, too. I mean, Absolutely. there were no fun days, probably. Mm -hmm. um, but you seem really you seem like a happy person. And that's marvelous in and of itself, because your tone sets the tone for everybody, right? Absolutely. Um, but tell me the stories or a story, you know, like what happened? You know, it was very challenging. Um, and, and I make no bones about that. Yes, I am a very upbeat person. And so even when I'm describing negative news or anything like that, it's still with an upbeatness to it because that is, you captured it, that is exactly who I am. Um, but there were challenges. I mean, we had families that experienced a lot of loss. We had staff members who experienced a lot of loss themselves. Mm -hmm. um, COVID impacted all of our lives in every aspect of our lives. Even if we didn't see it readily, it was coming and yeah. it was going to happen. And so being able to have those supports in place for our families, but also our employees, because they're the ones who have to take care of our students, but somebody still has to take care of them. They yeah. have to, we have to be able to take care of each other and of ourselves. Yeah. And so um, it, it was very challenging. I think one of the main lessons learned through all of those challenges, and I'll get into some specifics in just a moment, is that um, vulnerability is not a weakness. It's absolutely a strength because it humanizes all of us. And I think sometimes we are so busy being so strong and being everything to everyone else, we forget that human component of vulnerability. And um, I think one of the things that we have learned through this as leaders um, is that being vulnerable 
is a true sign of it's a tr it's a sign of strength because it humanizes us, it helps us move forward, and then we can be open enough to listen to solutions that we may not have thought of. Hearing the stories of our families, um, hearing the stories of our students, looking at uh, what some of the challenges were when you know we have teachers and support staff learning Google Classroom. Then what's that professional development that we have to do? But now what is the development of our families? Because we now have parents who are in the role of being teachers for their children. And that's not a role that they were assuming because they had the school. But yeah. when we were virtual, we had families that um, had to assume that role. And so we had to do professional development for our families. I think one of the stories was, um, especially when we first made the transition, we were not initially one-to-one. -one. And so we had families, and, and I will say, one of the best decisions that we made out of that was, again, through Mr. Baker's office, was looking at, with the computers that we have, how do we strategically address the learning needs of our students? And so the recommendation that he brought forward was, he said, Mrs. Adams, we can have every household with one device. We can start with every household having one device. That way we know that at least at the base level, every family has at least one computer. And then we opened up the option for our families who may have had multiple devices in their home. You could opt in for a district computer or you could continue to use your own. So we had families that said, you know what? We have two computers, we have two kids, our kids are gonna be fine. Go ahead and have ours go to another family. So when you hear that about, you know, families just pitching in for each other, that is a sense of community. Uh, mm -hmm. We had numerous community partners um, invest in refurbished computers so they could help us close that digital divide. And, and then when we received our funding for the Smart Schools grant, where we were able to then transition to the one-to-one, -one, uh, when we could do one-to-one -one allocations for our students with the computer devices, we started with the families that had the most children and worked our way backwards. So we had some families who had maybe six kids, seven children in the home, um, maybe two families in the home, but yet you have six, seven children that may be sharing one or two devices. Mm -hmm. Now we can bridge that equity gap and we can start there and work our way down the list. And, and again, our community stepped up, um, Albany Fund for Education stepped up and uh, worked with their partners to get you know refurbished computers, brand new computers, and they helped us close that digital divide so that now we can say that we are a one-to-one -one school district. Um, it was just heartbreaking sometimes to see, you know, students having to stagger their learning because they're sharing a computer in the home. I will say what we did as an organization, we took that into consideration when we built our elementary schedule, our middle school schedule, and our high school schedule. We took those things under consideration so that as we built the schedule, we knew that if there were certain breaks at the elementary level, then this is where the middle school can fit in, and here's where the high school can fit in. And so if there were multiple students in the home, I'm not going to say that it was perfectly aligned, but it was aligned such that if they needed to share, there was, you know, there were opportunities where they could transition from, you know, one student to the next student to the next student. It wasn't perfect, but it did, it did help us a lot. And we had so many families that were just, thank you so much for doing that. We really appreciate it. But we, we're ready to get our next computers. <laughs> we're ready so that our kids don't have to share. And we, we totally understood that. We completely understood that. Um, but I think that's because of all of the planning that we did to accommodate that. That's an amazing story. And I'm assuming two things happened. One, the parent who had multiple kids, especially a single family, single parent, mm -hmm. was like, 
I'm so glad you staggered it because there's no way I, I don't have a husband around or, you know, maybe it's a guy with no wife. So I'm helping the kids log on and I'm doing blah, 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 blah. And it was, yeah. So that was probably huge for them. But also the sense of community just went off the Richter scale, right? Absolutely. Because now, now you've just, you know, honorarily dubbed every parent also a teacher. And they're like, what? Okay. Um, I guess I am too. And, and we have the tutorials. Up. We have the tutorials to, we did um, orientation for our parents at all of our schools. They held virtual orientations to show parents how to log in. We posted yeah. those on our website so that parents could go to it. And then when they would log in to Google Meet, or I'm sorry, Google Classroom, they could access that tutorial right there, real time. You don't have to toggle back and forth. It can take you right through exactly what you need to do. I think another uh, piece that was really important for us because um, we are we are a um, 100% free and reduced lunch district. Wow. And so one of the things that we were able to do right away, day one, when we transitioned, we had a program. Our Lisa Finkenbinder is amazing. She is our food service coordinator. Day one, we were out delivering food. We wow. had our food bank set up where you could do grab and go. Families could come and get it, you know, socially distance and everything. You could come pick up the lunches and the breakfast and go. Or if there were some reason that you could not do the grab and go, we had our folks in place to do deliveries and our transportation department ready to go with delivering. Now, at first, we had a central site where you would have to come to that was probably a little closer to your home. Yeah. But what we evolved to roughly within the first three weeks, uh, we were able to then get the addresses. We had a survey that was done. We had the addresses of the families. And then we had teams that we deployed out directly to our families. And of course, it was like what the restaurants do during COVID. You know, we would, we would do the call, uh, you know, before we would get there and say, we're, this is the city school district of Albany. We're here to deliver your lunch. We'll be there in about three minutes. And they knew we would come, we would put it on the doorstep and then they would come out, pick up the bag and, and then we were off. And so we had, um, I mean, it was just amazing. And again, our community stepped up because of course we needed support with that. So we had volunteers that pitched in to assist us through um, Jonathan Hendrick, who is the pastor of Christ Church here in Albany. And he helped organize volunteers from his church. And they, you know, we had them come on board and, and help us with those deliveries. That's amazing. So you, we were talking about Uberization earlier today <laughs> about the new model and, and you come mm -hmm. on and like, you've already Uberized the food part. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Yeah, so I I, I, I want to ask about model too because okay. you're headed for heavy winds now in model shift. Mm -hmm. And I want to explain that for a second. And then I want to go into the social emotional side because you cited a really amazing okay. stat. But let's talk about model. So you've waded into the deep end, hot and heavy in the last year. In terms of what our research organization and news media organization is looking at, we, we know that age, grade, move along the assembly line in a normatized pattern. Everybody's supposed to be similar, you know, the same in order to stay on pace. That's not a human condition and it never has been. Mm -hmm. There's always the oddball out who's three years behind in math, but he's brilliant in language. And then suddenly the light bulb goes on and he zooms ahead. Like mm -hmm. what is going on here? But that's just what happened. So we, so this is a uh, systemic inequity. The structure itself is a, is a structural inequity, right? Because it forces normative patterns. Mm -hmm. It says you have to be the same in all these subjects at this age as everybody else that's your age and move along the assembly line, please move along. So we've been really addressing this. So you've now leveled up, you took on food logistics. What do you think about the the hybrid logistics idea, like the uberization of the human intersection. Have you even heard about this? I'm, I'm going to take it for with a different angle. Okay. okay. And I'll, okay. I'll answer it with a, a little bit of specificity around blended learning. 
Okay. Because that's one of the reasons that we looked at true blended learning, not just converting what we've done in person to um, an online platform, but yeah. looking at that purposeful design of engagement okay. where students work with their teacher okay. to own their own learning time and their own pacing through a blended learning model. I love it. It's one of the most equitable things that we can do for our students. Because what it does is it puts it, it puts not only, and when I say this, I, I don't want it confused with, oh, now the teacher's not doing anything, but it puts a lot of that accountability and that learning in the hands of the student. And what that means is they become empowered and they become the advocate for their own learning. Now, I'll give you a little bit of background. So this is a process. Yeah. Um, this did not happen overnight. But the reason that we are primed for this moment in time is because of the things that we had already been planning for and the things that we already did. So a little history. In 2019, our district developed its own first ever equity policy. And we had a large group of stakeholders that came together, board members, community members, parents, uh, teachers, support staff, uh, administrators came together. And then we held a separate student forum at each of our levels, elementary, middle, and high school, so that we could see, well, first of all, what does equity really mean to a child? Well, how do they see equity? Does that compare or are there disconnects between what the children see and what the adults see? And so Smart. we we have all, and all of this process is posted on our website. We have um, the students talking about what equity means to them. And then that was year one, where we spent the time defining equity for our district, which means very, and it, it sounds simple, but it is not. Ensuring that all students have what they need to succeed, no matter their zip code, no matter their socioeconomic status, no matter their economics, no matter their ethnicity, whatever you need, we will work to make sure that you have what you need to be success, su successful. And that doesn't mean that Kawita gets everything and Kawita gets nothing. It means that some students might need more and some students might need less, but yet and still every student needs to have the tools that they need in order to be successful. That was year one. 2020, we looked at actualizing equity. What's the evidence of it? If we say that this is how we define it, now, how do we actualize it? And each school in their school improvement plan, et cetera, had to develop what would equity look like? If I were to walk your building without you saying a word, what are the things that I should see that would be the evidence of equity? And we had our students participate in that as well. What the student forums and everything help us define what does it mean for you how do we then actualize it? And then taking it one step further, as a student, what's your role? Because you can't just push it off to someone else to you know, open up the brain and pour it in. That's not gonna happen. What's your role and your commitment to actualizing equity? So academically, we focused on student voice. We focused on teaching our students how to advocate for themselves and how to develop their voice. Now, all of this is happening at the same time. It's mm -hmm. not like you check a box and it's done. It is an ongoing process because as students get older, they have to actualize their voices in different ways. And you have to learn how to actualize your voice based on that content because it's very different, your advocacy in one course versus another. So we had to really work through that. We have a leader in me, elementary school, Pine Hills Elementary School, where Tia Corniel is the principal. And that's from Stephen Covey. And that model, we have used that model to help other principals understand how do you create those leaders from within so that they can then actualize equity through their voice. And so now in 2021, the third phase, which is going to be our heaviest lift and the longest phase is operationalizing equity. How do we take the definition how do we take the actualization of equity and now operationalize it so that it becomes the way in which we do business, period? 
That's going to take more than a year, just as we will redefine and continue to define equity over time, just as we will continue to actualize and teach students how to advocate for themselves and develop their own voice that is ongoing. The next layer is now within our departments and divisions, how are we operationalizing our policies and procedures what we do, how we, we have a um, policy review uh, committee and we have all of our policies on a cycle for review. And one of the things that we've done with our equity teams, which are in each of our schools, we have, had, we have select members that we're developing so that when we are reviewing policies in the cycle of review, we specifically take a look at that policy and look through the equity lens to make sure that what we say we believe, how we actualize it is now a part of our operations. And then each of our departments and divisions have outlined and looked at their procedures to make sure that they have an equity lens in our business practices, in our HR practices, in our payroll purchasing, even in our capital projects, looking at it through an equity lens. So again, this is the heaviest lift that yeah. we're going to have. But when we talk about all of that and how it supports the instructional framework, if you will, then it directly relates to how every single division and department in the district supports the delivery of quality instruction through an equity lens and then through blended learning, which is the most equitable thing that we can do by giving students as we work on student voice, as we work on how they are actualizing equity for themselves, now we have that blended learning component, which helps them learn how to manage their own time, space, and place of learning. So that acquisition of knowledge is not something that is such a challenge that they can't face it and overcome it. Yeah. So I hope that answers your question. I mean, it's kind of a roundabout way, but it is when you ask what is it that we are doing through blended learning because of the the sheer design of blended learning it helps students really tune into how they learn what they're learning and what is the best model for their learning and yes the teacher is right there with them facilitating that learning well, Kawita, this is amazing. And I love the way that you, you layered it. And the image that I'm getting in my mind now, if I was a student in your school, is, is I'm not receiving an authoritarian, autocratic, top-down, do this or else attitude. I am early on indoctrinated in the fact that I'm my own person. And I'm in charge. And I will tell you, we've had, you know what, 200 years or so of the opposite, mm -hmm. where education was done to you. Correct. And now we're telling everyone. And I think some of the older kids are, are, are in shaky territory because they've never had a, allowed agency. And the agency's been killed in them, right? Mm -hmm. They don't even know how to be an agent for themselves. And so when you're asking them to do that, it's such a, it's like a serious social, emotional challenge. You're asking me, like, are you sure you're not going to beat me as soon as I speak <laughs> up? Like what is happening? I love that. <laughs> you know, I love that because like, here's the thing in our yeah. social studies classes at our high school, you know, we've been um, teaching them to advocate and we ask those probing questions to get what they really think, feel, and believe. And as we work through, um, I remember sitting in a department meeting for social studies and one of the activities, the kids were analyzing, um, they were analyzing the civil war and they were, they were looking at both sides and they were analyzing, you know, they were analyzing slavery. And the teacher asked the question that would garner their opinion. And she called on a student and the student said, and again, she's relaying the story in the department meeting, but yeah. she said, the student said to her, do you want me to tell you what I really think or feel? Or do you want me to tell you what I've been taught to tell you? Wow. 
And she said, and, and so Let it's it just go. like what you said, have you been so institutionalized that all you do is regurgitate what you know the system wants to hear? And when do we develop that courage, which goes back to that student voice and teaching students how to advocate, you know, in proper ways so that your voice can be heard? When do we then accept their voice for what it truly is and not judge or condemn? And so she was saying that that was just an eye opening moment for her to realize that how many other times when she's asking those types of questions, kids are just institutionalized. And so they just respond with what they think you wanna hear, which may not be what they wanna hear. It's kind of like the child who, you know, I'm an educator and I would love for my children to be educators, but it's that, it's that child who feels that they have to do what their parents did versus, what, versus following their true passion. Because if I don't do what my mom or dad did for a living, oh my gosh, the world is going to crash. The sky is going to come caving down. And what they have to realize is, no, it's not about telling us what we just want to hear because we can't do our best for you if we don't know what you really think, feel, and believe. But you have to create the safe spaces for that too. So there's a whole lot, when you talk about that social emotional learning, there's a whole lot of that social emotional learning that goes into creating that safe environment so that students are comfortable saying their truth and saying what they believe and not being condemned for it. This is awesome. Kawita, I wanna go into one final area, which is your social emotional numbers that you talked about. And you talked about that, but before I do, I just wanna say, I hope you recognize you've been in a perfect storm. Like digital transition, is not what it appears. Right. It's not just machines. No. The move to have every single student realize they've been uncanceled and they are in charge is a monumental human shift. Mm-hmm. You know, you are not like the serf to this institution of authority anymore. You're your own being. Right. That alone, I really believe is the greatest thing that could have come out of the pandemic. It was a bad thing Mm -hmm. that created an unbelievable freedom for the first time. Right. I mean, it's amazing. I mean, just, I mean, if you think back to your own childhood, if you remember any of those moments where you felt like put upon and mean teacher, you know, I had some of those, I don't know if you did, but I didn't feel like I was in charge of anything. I was an automaton moving down the hallway, going to the next class when the bell rang. You know what I'm saying? So So my life was a little different um, because I did have educators as parents, but I, as I have gotten older, um, I, I realized how progressive my parents really were. Mm. Uh, I am the youngest of two and my sister was five years older than I am. So we were both almost like only children. uh, And I credit my parents for being able to have the vision and the foresight, but they allowed me to truly be me. They really did. That's and great. they encouraged, you know, the crazy ideas that I had as a kid. They, and, you know, I'm not going to say that they never said no, but um, I found the way to their heart. I did well in school and I didn't get in trouble. So pretty much yes was the answer for just about anything <laughs> that I wanted to do because they were educators. So, yeah. you know, that, that yeah. was their value. I quickly learned what their value was and I was good with it. So I did well in school and I didn't get in trouble. And consequently, yes, was what I heard most of the time. Um, and so in that, I think having had both of them as the phenomenal role models that they were, that's something that I've carried with me. So being able to have diverse students in my classroom as a teacher and even as an assistant principal and principal um, and supervising schools from an associate superintendent to now being a superintendent, understanding that importance of individuality while being a part of a community and a part of a system is something that I do understand really well um, because I did not always fit the mold. I did not. And, and having parents as well as some teachers who embrace that 
um, I saw the value of that um, because there were times when absolutely because I didn't, I may not have fit a traditional role of X, Y, and Z. I was allowed to do that without any reservation, without any barriers or, or you know, anything. And to have that level of encouragement, being the only one in many environments who may have looked like me or been from my background or been from, you know, my family upbringing, I'm very comfortable in that space, but I'm also comfortable in the space where I am with people who look like me and who are me. And so having parents who I know now strategically, deliberately embraced who I was and put me in those multiple um, diverse environments, I see the value of that. And so I was allowed to be an individual within a system. And, and that's really the best way that I can explain that. Mm -hmm. And so helping our students grow and know who they are, embrace their own individuality, but still be a contributing member to their community is extremely important. Yeah. And so when you say that, I just I think about that and I think, you know, this is a journey. It's it's and I'm by no means am I telling you that we have checked the box and we are there. We are not. We are on the journey and we have that vision of where we want to be as a district of caring individuals who are providing robust learning environments for our students. Well, I'm proud that you're on that way. And I, I think that the profoundness, because you came from such an ex uh, excellent environment, but, but a lot of your kids didn't. A lot of these students did not. Mm -hmm. And the fact that you're handing them the baton of student agency voice and choice is more than you know. Well, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. So let's talk about that social emotional stuff as the last point that we want to talk about. So you made a profound statement in the beginning about, you know, surveying them too. Like, I don't know anybody else has done that. That is an amazing. What, what happened with that? So this was um, a direct relation uh, for the ARP monies that we received. And so we developed a survey. And one of the things we looked at, what were the what were the qualifiers of ARP? Okay. Because, you know, if it wasn't going to qualify, then I, there's not any, I'm not going to be able to do anything with it. So yeah. we developed our survey around those categories that would qualify for ARP. And we okay. sent it out to parents. We sent it out to students. We sent it out to um, our community partners and community members um, businesses, et cetera. And okay. so when we pull that data together and when we separated it by stakeholder group, every single stakeholder group, the number one priority was social and emotional well-being and the mental health, uh, the mental health and well-being of our students, our families, our teachers, and our staff, because it is so critical. I mean, we always think in terms of what we do for our students, but many times we forget that we have to take care of the people who are in charge of taking care of the students. Yeah. And so we've looked at that and, and the way that that has manifested itself, we use a second step program at the elementary level. Okay. We, have, uh, we are training um, at the secondary level, we're training our teachers and support staff in Ruler, the Yale program. So we're implementing that. Um, and then we're looking at phasing that all the way through our curriculum. But one of the things that we do daily is there is a daily component of social emotional learning. At all of our levels, there is a daily component. And so we, we know at the secondary level, it's a little bit more challenging, um, but we are definitely fine tuning, you know, as you start to, you know, the best laid plans, then you start to implement and you realize you have a few bugs there. So we know that there are a few bugs, um, but we're working that out. Um, but we are committed to um, the situational analysis and then looking at students being able to voice how, you know, the particular scenario made them feel. Um, we have implemented at the elementary and at the elementary level, we have um, one book, one school. And it is a book that is focused on social emotional learning as well as culturally responsive education. 
to make sure that we are, are again, I gave you the demographics, we're roughly 80% students of color. So we want to make sure that in the literature that we provide for our students, that they get to see themselves um, in that literature, they get to see themselves in those examples. And so we want, we, we do that throughout, uh, but we really focus on it when it comes to social emotional learning. And so it too is a journey. Um, we have not arrived and, and I don't know if we ever will because it will continue to evolve as the needs of our students evolve. And so right now, there may be a connectedness that we're trying to build with our students to rebuild that family within the school system. There, there, therein lies that connectedness that we're building. Then the next phase may be something else. And as we transition to that, then we will look at what's the social emotional component to this particular dilemma that we're seeing. And now what do we need to do to wrap our arms around that? And then we'll move to that and we'll move to the next. And we, will con we are committed to evolving with our students so that we will alter what we're doing and make those changes as we move forward. We have a cycle of continuous improvement here. We implement that with everything that we do. So there's always the progress monitoring of where we are and the monitoring of our progress. And so those, those two things are a little bit different, but we, we do that along the way. We make those mid-course corrections. And then if it doesn't work, we figure out why it didn't work. And if it's time to cut bait, then we need to leave that alone because we're not gonna get the desired result. But if we tweak it this way, we might get that desired result. So then let's try it this way. But we just continue with that cycle of continuous improvement because we always want to make it better for our students. Yeah, I'm really glad to hear that. But I also want to make sure that, like, you need to hold a little commemorative moment with you and all your staff. Because in this digital transition, not only did you lay down the stakes of a complete change with digital, but you've also had a revolution mm -hmm. in student agency that is a revolution yeah. right that is huge and Thank then also you. equity right mm -hmm. so that revolution of equity and agency is monumental and it accompanies something else that is you know now you know, you're delivering digitally mm -hmm. absolutely it's a totally different thing so mm -hmm. i know you're making progress and you still have your sights on the future but hold a moment you know you need to have a moment because it, so you, you did that so when you say that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to direct you to albanyschools.org okay. and you will see all of our celebrations um, at oh, our good. board meetings. Our students are celebrated. We bring them in. Um, usually when we, at the end of the superintendent's report, there is a school highlight and they get to yeah. share out all the great things that are happening at their school. And there's always awesome. a student component. Before COVID, students would appear in person and they would share, they would bring artifacts, they would engage the board in, you know, hands-on, like two-minute hands-on projects that they could do. Uh, <laughs> but now our students are engaged in the board meeting virtually. So our, our schools will uh, record them and then they will play that. Um, we are a district of celebrations. Uh, because I do believe in that. I believe that, you know, um, and sometimes I, I've been told that you just celebrate way too much. You know, it's so hard and everything is you know, so negative and you're still <laughs> celebrating. And, and my response has been, I know that bad things happen. I know that this, this pandemic has impacted our lives in every aspect in so many negative ways. But what we can't lose sight of is the fact that our kids have been learning they have been growing. And to show those bright spots through the pandemic provides hope and promise yeah. for our children. Yeah. And those are the people that I have to make sure don't get so bogged down that they can't see their way through to the other side. Yeah. And so when you look at our website, albanyschools.org, you will see lots of celebrations. You will see our equity and education plan and the things that we're doing. You'll see all of what I explained that we've done over the years. You'll see it in our through our student lens, our faculty and staff lens, our administrative lens. You'll see that on our website um, because we do celebrate and we, we really, each of our buildings, they post all the great things that they're doing. Um, we also share out when we have challenges. I just did a board meeting 
um, our last board meeting and I just, you know, all the challenges over the past month with opening up the new, opening up this school year, that while we've had these bright spots, here are the challenges that we faced and here are our next steps that we're gonna take to remedy those challenges. So we didn't just present the problem, we presented here are the challenges and here are the solutions that we're gonna start working with so that we can come out on the other side. But albanyschools.org, you'll see a lot of celebrations. Um, I will highlight one other thing that I think is important. Um, you know, it's nothing like hearing it from the voices of our children and that's what we promote, our students' voice. So during the pandemic, we did interviews with our students and had them post a day in the life. If it was in-person learning or if it was virtual learning, um, we had them submit and then we posted. And all of them were like, they, they weren't all, you know, roses. Some of them were like, oh my gosh, I had a challenge here. I did this. But then from that challenge, here's what I was able to do. My teacher helped me do this. My parents helped me do this. But you'll see those videos posted um, a day in the life of virtual learning, a day in the life of in-person learning. And we also captured some of our parents' point of view, as well as our teachers, because our teachers had to make the transition. And so it helped our families understand what teachers were going through in order to deliver this type of instruction that was new to some of our teachers. And so yeah. you can, you'll find that on our website as well, but you get to hear from the actual beneficiaries of what we have done through that struggle and, and what happened coming through it on the other side. Awesome. Well, this has been awesome. I can't wait to put this whole story up nationally for our whole audience. You know, we have 315,000 readers, mostly administrators in K-12. Um, and we put it out. People are watching it, you know, like in their spare time. You know, they no time always to attend live and they're watching it at midnight. But this has been awesome. So thank you so much, Kawita. Thank you I so consider very you much. a new friend who I greatly admire. I'll be in your fan club now from here well, on out. Thank you. Yeah. So thank you for being with us. And also thank you to our audience. I, you know, this is Leilani Cawthon, CEO of Learning Council News, Media and Research, saying thank you to Kawita. Thank you guys for attending. This is our day tomorrow. We're going to have another day for the New York, New Jersey area because we can't come back there physically yet, although we're coming next year. Bergen County invited us. So we're coming um, in person, just like we were in Dallas and Atlanta last week. Last week. We're coming. Um, but this is our day tomorrow that I'm showing you on the screen right now. And uh, thanks to our sponsors again as the last minute. Thank you before I release you back into the wild. Thanks to our sponsors and thanks to you, Kawita, and thanks to the thank guys you. who attended. Hopefully we'll see you tomorrow. Bye, everyone. <laughs>